We're going to close with the communion like we do on Super Second Sundays, and then everybody's invited to stick around as much as you can, and we'll share lunch together. Um, but it is the last uh, time we're going to be talking about Nehemiah. So um, let's pray really quick, and then we'll uh, just briefly look at these last few chapters. So, Father, I pray that you would speak to us and change our lives in your precious name through the study of your word. And I pray that you would uh, help us to see in it what you would want us to see. In Jesus' name, amen. So let me just give, just in case you're visiting with us or you don't know anything about the book of Nehemiah, or if you've been here the whole time and you want to go, since we're concluding, I want to recap. <laughs> I'm going to give you a recap. This is, so let me just, the whole book, really, and super brief, so you might have to go back and read it, is the, the Israelite people are in exile in Babylon. There's a bunch of people that are changing hands of who's in charge. And then several years later, uh, Nehemiah is there. He's working for the, the emperor, the king. And he hears that Jerusalem, the city, is in ruins. Like the wall is all torn down and he's really upset about it. And he gets permission from the king and like his blessing to go back and fix it. And he goes and checks it out and it's a mess. But he talks to everybody that's living there and says, hey, let's fix this. And they're like, wow, okay. So they all get together, they work together, and they fix it. And other people had already been working, Ezra mainly, these kind of guys have been working to fix up getting the Hebrew people back to living by the law of God. And so this fit within that. And so once they had the wall all built, and people tried to stop them. They didn't like that they were doing this because this would mean strength back to God's people and stuff like that. And so there was a lot of accusation and everything. But they worked together. They got it done. And then after that, they had a gathering, and Ezra came back, and they were reading through the Bible and the law, and they're saying, okay, we haven't been living like this, so we're going to live like this now. And there's a big recommitment. And that's about where we're at in the story. And so these last three chapters, uh, Nehemiah 11 through 13, are kind of the closing of the story. And a lot of it is lists. Like I said, this book is different than a lot of the other Old Testament books. Not all of them, because the book, like, Numbers, has a lot of lists in it. But um, this is a first-hand account of Nehemiah's work and what they did. And he says, I, a lot, which is rare in the Old Testament. And he's, um, a lot of the, the, the way the book's written is he says something happened, and then, like, here's the list of people who did it. And then, like, here's another thing that happened. Here's the list of people who did it. And chapters 11 and 12 are a lot like that, where they're saying all the people that had committed to back, they're going to live for God now. Okay, yeah. And they're like, here are all the people that committed to do all those things. Because the, the temple and, and the, had all these rules that God wanted everybody to follow. Like, I want you to do all these different things, and I want you to live a certain way. And they weren't doing any of that. So they're saying, okay, we're going to do it now, and he's going to do this. I'll do that. And we're, we got it arranged, and here's the list of everybody committing to that. Okay, good. Right? And so we're going to jump in at the end of chapter 12. We're kind of towards the middle, I guess. 1227, where it starts to describe what they're doing as part of this. So they're coming right back to, we're going to live for God now, and they're celebrating the fact that they finished the wall. So the wall is done, and they're all, like, super happy, right? So 27, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out and were, from where they lived, and they were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully and dedicate with songs and thanksgiving, with music of cymbals and harps and lyres, um, and the musicians were brought together in the region of Jerusalem. So they talk about the guys. So they're saying, we're going to have a big party to celebrate the fact that we got this wall done, that God did this amazing thing. And then verse 31, then the leaders of Judah go up on top. I had the leaders of the Judah go up on top of the wall. I assigned two large choirs to give thanks. One proceeded to the right, and then some of the priests with trumpets went with them, and um, skipping down with musical instruments prescribed by David, the man of God. Ezra, the teacher of the law, led that procession. And at the fountain gate, they continued directly towards the steps of the city of David on the ascent of the wall and past the site of David's palace and the water gate on the east. The second choir proceeded the opposite direction. I followed them on top of the wall together with half of the people, past the tower of ovens, the broad wall, and over the gate of Ephraim. And, and so it gets very specific. Like, so he has two big choirs of musicians and people to march around on this wall they just built and celebrate the fact that they'd gotten this thing done. Um... And then the two choirs gave thanks and then took their places in the house of God. And so did I, together with the half, half of the officials as well as the priests. And then he lists off these priests. The choir sang under the direction of Jezariah, Jezrahiah, sorry. And the day they offered great sacrifices and rejoicing because God had given them great joy. <laughs> sorry. Uh, and the women and children were also rejoiced. And the sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem was heard for So I have my slide that there was much rejoicing in this this is when you must rejoicing. Now, there's a slide. It's not funny anymore. <laughs> All right, well, if you find that, 
It's a picture. <laughs> Never mind. It doesn't matter. Anyway, so, so then they keep going and they appoint everybody. They're like, okay, yay, there was a bunch. It's not, okay, anyway. So this was a happy time. They, uh, they, were, they, were, they had accomplished this thing and they were celebrating with music. There was much rejoicing by all people, young and old. And then they keep going and appointing everybody to take kind of their jobs within the temple. And they start putting stuff back that hadn't been there since like David's day. Like, you know, in, in Solomon's day with these musicians playing and worshiping before God and all this kind of stuff. And it's like a really good party. And you're like, yeah, this is great. Like, that's what they set out to do. And they did it. And uh, everyone lived happily ever after. Except for there's chapter 13. <laughs> and so this is where this is kind of the, the interesting twist that happens at the end of the book. And I would mentioned this a couple weeks ago. They're like... They do this really great thing, and it's really good, and it's all really happy, and there is much rejoicing, and everything is celebrating something awesome that God did, and God did it through them, and it was really great. And then there's chapter 13, which ends on a weird note. And again, we're going to kind of jump around a little bit because it's still some listing and stuff because they're talking about different stuff that they were going to do. Um, but essentially what happens is they accomplish what he's supposed to do, and then Nehemiah goes back. Like, he didn't stay. He's like, all right, you guys good? And they're like, we're good. We're going to do this God thing? Yes, you're going to do it. Okay, good. All right, I'm going to go back to the king now and tell him that we got this thing done. And then he leaves. And then the story kind of picks back up where he comes back to check out, like, all right, guys, how are we doing? And it's not good. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to come in. Uh, I'll just paraphrase some of this. Essentially, like, they'd set up all that stuff. Like, this is, this is God's, you know, this is God's temple. Here's the rules. This is what God had. God had given instructions earlier in the Bible about how he wanted his temple working out. So it was like, this is the place you're going to keep the stuff that you use for the temple. And this is the stuff that these priests get. Like, that's how they get paid. And then because of that, they're going to do this work over here. And these are the priests that are going to do it. And they have it all listed out, like, specifically. We kind of skipped over it. But they're, going to, they're committed. Nehemiah gets it committed. They clean the place out. They're ready to go. And it's all set up. Then he comes back and finds out they're not exactly doing that. So he says, Eliashib, the priest, had put in charge of the storerooms of the house of God. Was, he was closely associated with Tobiah, and he provided him with a large room formerly used to store, store the grain offerings and incense and the temple articles, and also for the tithes of grain and new wine and olive oil prescribed to the Levites, musicians, and the gatekeepers and contributions of the priests. So just so you know what's going on, there's a guy in charge of keeping track of the rooms. You know, he's like, hey, this is for God's stuff. And he's like, got it. And then he's like, hey, his friend goes, hey, can I live in there? And he's like, sure, why not? So they like take all the God stuff out, and he's like, you can just live in there. That's fine. It's like an apartment now. And so Nehemiah's coming back expecting the room to be full of God stuff, and he's like, there's a dude in here, you know? <laughs> and so he says, uh, but he makes it clear. By while, while this was all going on, I was not in Jerusalem, you know? And so he comes back. And here I learned about it, giving him a room in the courts of God. And I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobias' household goods out of the room. And I gave orders to purify the rooms and put them back of the equipment to the house of God and the green offerings and incense. So he's like, what's going on? There's a guy living in here. So he throws him out and says, this is supposed to be for God's stuff. So he gets it cleaned up. But then he keeps going around. He also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had been given back. to see, the Levites are the guys serving. So their whole, all they do is work in the temple and stuff. And so... The way God had set it up is because these guys are working on behalf of you guys in the temple, you guys give to this temple, and that gives to them, like it pays them. It's kind of like what I do, I guess. Like I work here at the church, and then what everybody gives, we, we get paid to work here. And so um, they, everybody stopped, and so they're like, well, I, I got to live. So they just kind of left the temple duties and went back to like farming and stuff. And so they, he's like, there's nobody serving in the temple. Like, well, what do you want us to do? We're not getting paid anymore. He's like, why is this not working? And so Nehemiah is very frustrated. Um, and he, tries, and he tries to get that all set back up. And then in verse 15, he says, In those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine and grapes and figs and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing it all, all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore, he warned against selling of food on that day. And so this is actually kind of even more personal. See, first off, like, this was God's house thing, and it was, you know... There were guys, and there's other prophetic books, like Zerubbabel building the temple and everything. It's like, that's kind of personal for him. And then, like, Ezra, they committed to, like, living a certain way, and now they're not doing that anymore. It's kind of, like, law and faithfulness. But then, like, now this is Nehemiah saying, like, hey, I built this wall with you guys, and now you're doing stuff with the wall that God says not to. And it keeps going, because you're not supposed to be bringing... On God's Sabbath day, it's free from risk. You don't sell things. You don't bring things in the gate. 
You don't do all this sort of stuff. And they're carrying on like it's just any other day, not setting it apart for God, but involving the wall. So he's like, all right, on the Sabbath, we shut the door. And if you're not, if you're not, you can't come in. Like, sorry. You know, and so he's basically going back through and systematically saying, we're not, all that stuff we just talked about, and we said we were going to live for God, we're like not doing it. And, and then he talks about the, that there was a, I don't want to get too much into this today because it's, it doesn't really matter, but if you read also in Ezra, because he goes into another thing here, that the men had committed to not intermarrying with the local people around the area. And so if you read the Ezra account of this, they're even like saying, I know you married somebody, but you need to send them away. And it could get kind of complicated because is the Bible telling people to be divorced and all this kind of stuff. And really what this is about, just so we're clear, um, is purity. God is saying, I want you to be my people separate from everything. And the whole time he's been saying, don't intermarry with people because when you do that, you start to take in their ideas and then you start to worship their gods. And then several generations down, you're worshiping their gods instead of worshiping me. So this is kind of the idea. So the way we would apply this to us, because there's also books in the Bible like the book of Ruth, which is literally somebody marrying somebody that's not, and that's like David's great-grandmother or whatever. So it's, there's, a, there's a lot more to say about this, so we're just going to skip it for the day. The point is, for us, is holiness and living separately, like away from things that would draw us away from God. And that was the point that there was being made in this marriage situation. He's like, but they had said before, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, which you probably don't, but if you remember, one of the things they listed off is like, we won't do that marrying thing anymore. Like, we're going to stay pure like God wants us to do for the sake of, for worshiping him and that kind of thing. And we make these kind of statements to God too. Like, I'm not going to do that anymore, you know, and then come back and we're like, why are you doing this again? Which is what we're going to talk about. Um, so we get down to the kind of, we get near the end. And he's just basically, he goes away, he comes back, nobody's following through with everything, and he's systematically cleaning everything back up again. And he, said, and he finds even the priests are not doing what they're supposed to do. And so it ends on this really weird note. So we're, like, we're in verse 30 and 31. So he's like, so I purified the priests and Levites and everything foreign and assigned them duties, each to their own task. I also made provision and contributions of wood, to the designated times in the first few. So he's like, I, he went back, so he comes back and he sets everything back the way it's supposed to be again. And then he ends with this, remember me with favor, Lord, which is like, remember I tried. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just a really weird way to end a book like this. Like, it's like such a, you know, victorious, great book. You know, you get into this whole thing like, we're going to rebuild the wall and you can't stop us bad guys and then they don't and God comes through and they get it all done and they're like, we, we'll live for God now and it's going to be awesome and then there's much rejoicing and then there's this last chapter of, and none of that really happened. And Nehemiah's like, God, remember I tried, please. The end. Go to the next book. And you're like, what is this? <laughs> so what does this mean? Um... And I think we can take this on two levels. Uh, the first one is that, uh, and I think they're both good. This, the first one is kind of what I'd said a couple weeks ago, because we all say stuff like this. Like, you, you stand before God and you make all that, all right, no more, I'm not doing this anymore. And it's actually a really good thing to do. Like, so I'm not putting this down, okay? This is right, a good takeaway is that it's always a good time to recommit to God. Like when you re realize, like Nehemiah is showing back up in your life or my life, and you go, hey, you're compromising here again. You go, no, okay, I'm not going to do that again. Like you do what he does. You go through and say, there's not supposed to be a dude living in here. This is God's space. Get this stuff out of here. You know, this is a different space. This part is, is meant for something else. So you go in your life and go, okay, this is space isn't supposed to have a dude living in it. It's supposed to have God living in it. I'm going to get this stuff out of here. This is a good application of this. It's always a good time to repent and set things back right. And it's not just once. That was the thing I was trying to say a couple weeks ago. There's probably a grand once where we turn towards the Lord. We call that salvation. But for the rest of the time, <laughs> it's going to be happening every day or forever. You know, and older people go, yes. Like, it doesn't go like, then, then that one day I'm like, good. It's like, no, we're always repenting and turning back to God. And there's always dudes wanting to move in. Hello? You know, like, and, and, and what you can see in that kind of picture is <laughs> the word idolatry is what comes to mind. And Tim Keller always describes that as, because it's obvious, like, bad things. Like, if they went into this list and it's like, and then Nehemiah came back and everybody was killing each other. He'd be like, whoa, like, that's bad. Like, stop killing it. But that's not really what we're finding here. 
What we're finding here is things that are just like not the way they're supposed to be. Like, meaning, um, for example, like idolatry is taking something that may not even be bad in and of itself, but then making it ultimate. Yeah. Like, and so you take your friend and he needs a place to live. And you're like, well, I'll put you in God's place or whatever. You know what I mean? Like this, the God says, don't put anything else here. This is a special separate thing. You're like, eh, it'll be cool this time. You know what I mean? And he makes an exception and puts, and you start to see that when we take good things even, not just bad things, bad things are obvious. We'll get that out of the way. But when you take a good thing and make it an ultimate thing, that's when it becomes an idol. And you start to say, I'm going to serve that instead of God. And this is the kind of thing God is most particularly concerned about. And we do this in our culture all the time. We just don't, like I, we've said a bunch, that we don't have idols in our house, in our culture anymore, which almost makes it a little harder to deal with because we don't think we're worshiping anything. We think, I can only worship God, so it's cool. But we end up worshiping all sorts of things that might even be good things, like money is the obvious one, power is another one. You know, and we start to make uh, good things, ultimate things, and that idolatry breaks our relationship with God and ruins our lives. And it's time to, like, stop doing that. And the biggest avenue or the biggest way for that to happen in all of us is this. We all know that. We're giving space to a guy in our head, you know, who doesn't really care about us. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So, um, <laughs> okay, yeah, your kids, your parents might struggle in this season with making politics an ultimate thing. So you might need to remind them it's good and it's important, but it's not ultimate. So, um, but really what this is in the Bible, see the Bible is a book, but it's a collection of books. And that's why like in this it says the book of Nehemiah and this one, the book of Esther. You know, these are books within a book. So this is kind of like a library um, a collection of books, and they're put together on purpose and with intention, and in the timeline, like they're gathered by types and stuff like that, but in the timeline, this book of Nehemiah is quite near the end of the Old Testament time. Then there's kind of a gap, and then Jesus shows up, all right? And so in that idea, what this, so the first takeaway being it's always a good time to repent and cleanse things again. Even if it's again. It's like, again then. Let's do it again. But the second thing is this realization that both biblically, on a big picture, and personally, we need more than just human effort to make things right. Like, you can't just say, I'll try harder next time and get there. It's not possible. And that's okay. Like, that's part of what this is supposed to be showing us. We actually... Um, the Israelites did recommit themselves just a couple chapters ago. And they're re-recommitting themselves again in this you know, we don't really know exactly what happens after this, as far as immediately. But what we need is more than a change of, we need a change of heart. And this is the kind of stuff that only God can do. And so, Justin, you guys can come on up here. Um, the Bible Project, when they talked about uh, the end of it, they said that our social and political forms can never quite accomplish what God is after. Because we need this change of heart. And that's not something we can do. We can change our minds sometimes. We can be convinced of things. But we need our hearts changed. And this is the big picture story of the Bible where you see what's going on here. God's been enacting a plan of saving the world from the beginning of the whole thing when we messed it up. And he's got his people and he's got his people living a certain way. And, like, and it's just not ever going to quite accomplish that thing. But then when you jump over to... Which, again, it's, it's because of how it's arranged, you don't quite see it. But it's almost just the next, it would really be like the next page, almost. You start to see when Jesus shows up, all of a sudden. And he starts to do that thing that we can't do. We need a change of heart. Really, what you'd say is we need a savior. We can't save ourselves. And this is where, this is good. Because what we're going to do as a church... Is starting next week, we're going to be going through the Gospel of Luke. And really what it is, is we're going to do the Gospel of Luke and Acts. And it's going to take a long time. Like, we're not going to rush through these ones. And we might have to take breaks because it's going to take so long, okay? And really, Luke and Acts are the same story. It's the same guy writing it. One is talking about the sudden pro prophetic breaking in of the Savior of the world to humanity, where he's like, 
you realize at the end of a book of Nehemiah, like, we're never going to be able to do this, are we, on our own? And you're like, no, but don't worry, God will. And you're like, well, how does that work? Well, <laughs> starting in the beginning of the book of Luke, we could start to see that story. But, and then the second part, the, chap- the book of Acts, is the, the movement that started after that. So the, Luke is Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection, and all of the meaning that's found in that. And then the movement that comes after that, that he starts called the church, which we're still a part of, is all written down in the book of Acts. And we're going to take a look at this, because what we need to do, I think, I think God is inviting us to kind of slow down and get back to the basics. Back to the basics of our faith. Who is Jesus? Like, you know, because you could read a book like Nehemiah and be like, I'm not Jewish. This doesn't mean anything to me. And that might be a fair, that would, if you're just like looking at it as a historical book, you could be like, I mean, I guess cool and all, and it's nice that that happened a long time ago, but what is it? I don't have any. But as a follower of Jesus who is Jewish, we start to see this continuity of the story and then his invitation to all of the rest of us. That God's point the whole time was to save the world. But he does it in ways that are maybe surprising. Because we like to think of saving the world in very, you know, and all of a sudden there's a baby that shows up, which we don't, y'all, we'll get to it. But I think when you say getting back to the basics, it's kind of a reconnection in our mind. So many people today try to make arguments, whether they explain it or not, they try to say like, well, these ends justify these means. Like we're trying to do this thing and we're doing it in a really bad way, but it'll, because it's, it makes it work and then it's okay because it's that important. And I don't, you don't see Jesus really doing that kind of thing. You see at least what you would call like a harmony between the ends and the means. But I might even say you would say that they're the same thing. Like if the ends and the means are different, then you're probably cheating or lying or something like that. There's a, Jesus does things with extreme continuity. And I think back to the basics is us as saying, I'm here as a Christ follower to live like he's living in this world. And the good thing is we have that written down and it wasn't like better back then okay (laughs) like things were pretty messed up and so you see how he lives a righteous holy god life inside a very messed up situation and by doing that saves the world and he's inviting us to be saved and to live out that same sort of salvation story here and we can do it and we will but we're going to take a minute to get through it And back to the basics of um, inviting us, even in this season, to really focus on worship and prayer. Spending time with God in groups and and alone. And then also, another big emphasis over this next season of Luke and Acts is just like, let's spend more time eating food together. Because most, (laughs) you start to see that patterns show up. And in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus spends a really whole lot of time eating with people. And that, that makes it a good thing. Like, eating with people is a good thing. And this is something that we can all do, you know? And so, it's kind of like a bringing up of like, when you see Jesus start to do things, he is reaching down into our world, but he's also bringing things up into his world at the same time, you know? We'll get to it. But we're going to start today. We're going to leave behind Nehemiah and be encouraged from what God has spoken through it. But we're going to look towards our need of a savior and and we're going to start by celebrating communion so Byron and Linda and Donald and Trudy I want you guys to come up to help serve so I'm going to pray right now because Jesus when he jumping to the end of the the story of Luke when he's going to be um, crucified for our sins he leaves his disciples and the rest of us with a meal to remember him by and so we always do this on Super Second Sunday as a way to start our lunch together is we have his meal together and it's one that we're all invited to Um, all those that want to put our faith in Jesus and he took this is what I'm going to read from this This is in Luke 22 19 so it's at the Passover meal with his disciples around a table and he says to them he took the bread he gave thanks and broke it and he gave it to them saying this is my body and it's given for you do this in remembrance of me and he's saying remember eat this in remembrance of me And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. And he leaves them with this meal to eat, to remember him by. 
But they also ate other stuff. That's why we like to do it with the Super Second Sunday, because it's, again, bringing the things like this. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to have them up here while they sing this song in closing. I want to invite any, all of us to come. And the way we do it is called intinction, where you take a piece of the bread and you dip it into the cup, and then you eat it. And then you can spend time, if you need, at the stairs here in the altar in prayer. We'll also have prayer teams if you need additional prayer. But I'm also going to pray for the food, the meal to start, and we'll just kind of end but if there are people up here praying, let's give, and kids especially, let's give some space. We don't want to be running around in here. You can run outside, and we have a playground. But in here, we need to, especially the front area, to stay kind of a worship space until people are done. And then everybody's invited to have lunch together. So, Father, I pray that you would bless this meal. You left us with this meal to remember you by, Lord. And I pray that we would, in fact, remember you um, as we take it and not take it for granted or unworthily, as you say. And I pray that we would... Uh, that you would bless our lunch time together, Lord, with your presence. And I pray that uh, we would encounter you as we encounter each other in this place. When you say two more are gathered in your name, that you're with us. So, Father, we pray that you bless this communion, that we might commune with you and with each other. In Jesus' name, amen.